Hey, what's up, guys? Welcome to the Dad Edge Podcast. I'm Larry Hagner, your host and founder of this show, this podcast, and this movement. Welcome to 2022. And we are actually, God bless, we are actually one month behind us already at the end of January. Many of you guys, I, I strategically put this show in here because many of you guys were a month into the, these New Year's resolutions and statistics clearly show that at least half of you guys have foregone your New Year's resolutions as it pertains to your health. So that's why we are timing this show perfectly to bring you some amazing health bomb knowledge uh, and it's going to be unexpected. I have a return guest with me today. I have a, he's a very good friend of mine. And we're going to be talking about uh, being vegan and being plant-based. And before you think that my guest today might be a woman or not a fit individual, just go check him out on Instagram. You'll probably think there's no way that this guy's vegan because he literally looks like he eats nothing but steak. He's so jacked and ripped. And no, he doesn't do any hormone replacement therapy. No, he does not do steroids. This man knows more about health and nutrition than anybody I have ever met on the planet. And I actually went to college for this. I actually have a degree in health exercise science with a minor in nutrition. And the, the knowledge that this guy has blew me away. So, you know, plant-based lifestyle, right? It seems to be everywhere, but is it really possible to maintain or grow muscle or to have a physique uh, without animal protein? Uh, are we going to feel tired? Are we going to feel hungry? What's going to happen to our testosterone? What about our libido? What about our sex drive? If I eat tofu, am I going to turn into a woman? Uh, today's discussion will be surprising what we're going to reveal to you guys today. We're going to be talking about having a plant-based healthy lifestyle for men. Uh, all, the, all the things that you probably see in the media uh, as it pertains to meat and animal protein, uh, the, the lies that we have probably been told since we have been kids, what to eat, uh, how it will change your blood work. And what I'm going to be doing today is not only sharing uh, all, the, all this knowledge with you guys, I've been a client also of Fraser for the past two years. Um, I was a doubter. I've been now plant-based for two years. I have my blood work results that are handy that I'm going to share as well. And by the way, I'm just going to share this. I, I love Fraser to death. I have no uh, financial connection to him whatsoever promoting him. I genuinely think he is one of the experts on the topic of being plant-based, not just being plant-based, but health and nutrition in general. So who is Frazier? He is a former butcher. Right? He's a former butcher, right? Butcher turned vegan. Wow. Right. He's from Auckland, New Zealand. It's a good thing that my wife isn't in here. He's got this cool accent and would probably like just, my wife would just love to hear him talk as she does. Uh, but before the, he grew up in New Zealand, obviously, but before that, uh, he did study nutrition and human structure and function, and he is in personal training from the University of Auckland uh, and Auckland University of Technology. Uh, Fraser comes to us with uh, with a background where he actually struggled with mental health and was depressed for 15 years of his life. Uh, but he is one of those people. He is actually identified as an INFJ on the Myers Briggs, which, as, if you guys know anything about that. Um, that's one of the rarest personality types. People who have that personality type read people very well. They're very empathetic. They're very in tune with other people. And what I can tell you is, uh, Fraser has been an incredible, just incredible mentor to me, to a lot of guys in our community in the data Alliance. He's actually now one of our team captains. He leads, um, our health and nutrition call team in the Alliance. Uh, he has coached many high level celebrities, Chris Daughtry being one of them. If you go to Chris Daughtry's Instagram and you see the crazy, ridiculous physique, the shape that that guy's in, uh, you can send Fraser a message and thank him for that. So Fraser, man, it's awesome to have you back. I'm excited to talk to you about this topic. What's going on? Absolute pleasure, brother. That was a, uh, very humbling introduction. So thank you. Um, I'm, I'm, I'm excited for round two. You know, I feel like we had so much more that we could have discussed after the first podcast. And I guess that's why we're here, right? To just make sure that we cover everything and we leave, you know, your audience with as much good, tangible knowledge, tactics, steps as humanly possible. And I think the fundamental thing is you don't have to be vegan or plant-based to listen to this to get tremendous benefits from a myriad of things that we will discuss. Yeah. Yeah. And I was, you know, you and I were talking before we even hit record today. And 
one of the things when, when we stopped the recording last year, this was a year ago this time that you came on. So it's literally been a year. And I was like, man, we didn't talk about hormones. Like we touched upon it because I shared my results of what my blood work looked like before I went plant-based and then after, but we didn't really hit home like the science of like being vegan and the impact that it could actually have, the positive impact that it can have on your testosterone and, and your hormones, your libido and all these things that a lot of guys are just really, really concerned about. And, um, but before we, we jump into all the science behind that, um, I want to give the guys just some context on, on who you are, because mm. if, if the guys haven't heard the first show, uh, mm. we're, we're going to have a yeah. link in the show notes for the, for the, for the previous show as well. But uh, I want you to share your story. I mean, butcher gone vegan, man. Like who does that? Right. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it, it's, it's definitely a, a paradigm shift. Right. And, and so I think that for myself, man, it's, I like to challenge that status quo. Um, I think I have this weird, weird I fas fascination with cultivating discipline around doing things that seem difficult. You know, like if there's something that seems difficult, it, it's almost that sort of David Goggins mentality of yeah. doing just cultivating grit uh, as, a, as a form of building credibility with yourself. And, and so for me, you know, back in my teens, dude, I struggled a bunch, like you mentioned in the introduction with mental health you know, bipolar disorder, severe social anxiety, ADHD. There was a point in my life where I'd been medicated on all of those things for almost 10 years. So I was on lithium carbonate, Ritalin, clonazepam, all these different medications. Dude, I had to go get blood work done every week to make sure that my blood was not hitting levels of toxicity. So, you know, if you're getting blood draws done every week, that obviously it's quite dangerous things you are playing with. and I was a, you know, I, I struggled in school. I, I did, I did not do well. Um, I was distracted. I, I got pulled into the wrong crowds, alcohol, drugs, like you name it, like the, the typical story of, uh, I guess, you know, of a teenager just trying to find themselves and making many, many mistakes along the way. And I left school young. Like I didn't, I didn't graduate with my friends and I fell into butchery because I was working in the butchery in the largest supermarket in New Zealand, just after school to make money. And I figured it's just an easy, it was an easy route. You know, it was right there in front of me. I didn't have to go apply to anywhere else. I just had to go to them and say, Hey, can I work here full time? And I had some degree of work ethic that they obviously saw in me because they got me on full time. And then I went into the apprenticeship process and I will say as, as morbid and as challenging and as depressing as that industry was, it did teach me a lot about discipline. I've had a lot of guys ask me if I'm for former military, literally the amount of people who have asked me if I'm former military is crazy. But I think it's because of the really hard way the industry shapes, shapes you, which can be a bad thing because you, if you don't attack, if you don't learn how to process your emotions and, and learn about yourself, it can be really destructive, but equally, I think it really cultivated a sense of discipline and, and just showing up in me. And then dude, it got, it got more challenging. So as I, as I went through this process, as I was doing this apprenticeship, um, you know, there was a lot of verbal abuse, even some physical abuse within that environment. Guys would get into fist fights. I mean, it was, it was your sort of typical wolf pack, like the alpha male wolf pack. And there was a hierarchy, there was a pecking order. And it was, it was very challenging. And um, I got to a certain point where my mental health got so bad that I seriously um, couldn't see myself being alive another year from now, if I was continuing in that same path. Um, I'd even had episodes where I'd overdosed on my medications um, it was just a vastly different person than I am now. And the main reason, dude, why I left that industry and why I went back to study and why I'm so fascinated with human psychology and ophthalmology and, and hormones and brain function and all these things is because of where I came from, because I came from a place of just so much pain. And I was told by experts, by psychiatrists, by experts that, this was just the way I was going to be. It'll just be something that I have to manage and deal with for the rest of my life. And that was, that's it. 
And I really, really got proactive with everything. I, I just became this avid student, constantly learning. And now I am over 10 years medication free. So I haven't had any medications for 10 plus years. I haven't consumed alcohol in probably seven years. Um, dramatically different life. And obviously being vegan now for over eight years. And so, you know, I understand where pe that people are in their journey. I think that's why I'm able to connect with such a wide range of people. Like you were mentioning, like some of the students aside from yourself and Chris Daltrey, the musician, I've done stuff with special forces, guys, police, pharmacists, doctors of a wide range of different doctors, commercial bankers, like the range of people's vast. And part of it is because I can see aspects of myself in their journey where they are like in their own evolution. And I, and like that INFJ personality type, I'm kind of able to meet them where they are and then help them walk along that path. But it's been, a, it's been a long journey, man. It's, it's not been, it's not all been all sunshine and rainbows, but I mean, whose journey is, is right. So I'm just here to share my knowledge, to share what's worked for me um, as someone who was down that end of the spectrum. And it feels like I've made a lot of progress, but I'm still a student, man. I'm still learning every day. Such good stuff, man. <clears throat> I got to tell you, and again, I'm going to remind the audience, um, I have no financial interest in, in Frasier uh, as far as like, if, if, you've, if you guys in the audience decide to work with Frasier, it's not like I get paid on that. I'm going to, so I'm going to speak from my heart. Um, you by five had coaches and mentors in my life. You are the best one I've ever had. And I'll tell you why. Uh, it's exactly what you just said. You know, you were, you were not only someone who pushed me, right? And challenged me, but you were very empathetic and you met me where I was. And it was never condescending. It was never demeaning. There was no question that I couldn't ask that it wasn't on the table, you know, and, and the level of service that you provided was unprecedented. If I asked you a question or I needed something, it was, you got back to me right away. Mm -hmm. And, you know, just in my own experience, I got to, you know, I'll share mine real quick. Right. I mean, you remember this. And for those of you guys who hadn't heard the first show, um, two years ago in November in 2019, I had some blood, I had routine blood work done. I've always dealt with high cholesterol my whole life. Genetically, like my dad has high cholesterol. He's been on Lipitor for gosh, 30 probably years. And, um, I, you know, I knew I had a high cholesterol at 30. Like I, you know, applied for an insurance policy and like, Oh, you got high cholesterol. I was like, okay, well, I didn't really think it was that big of a deal. I ate animal protein at every meal. I've always been a fitness guy ever since I was 18 years old. Um, always thought like, Hey, chicken, fish, steak, eggs, every meal, right. Whey protein in the middle. Right. And I'll never forget when I, um, I don't know if people really buy into like eat for your blood type or not. I, I did read the book though, cause I was curious and it just so happened that my blood type, they mentioned like, Oh, the one that would work best for you is plant-based. And I was like, that is hysterical. I will never be plant-based. I love me some steak. I love bacon. I love chicken. <laughs> I love everything. Right. And, um, so I had some really scary blood work done and basically what was revealed was, is you know, this is what you don't want to have happen. You know, your doctor comes in after getting the results. He's like, Hey, have a seat. And I'm like, have a seat. He's like, well, number one, you know, your cholesterol is, as long as I've known you, it's always been high, but now it's really high. You know, it's 287. You know, your LDLs are really bad. He's like, I'm just being real with you. Your LDLs are in the one nineties. Um, and I was like, he's like, so we've got to get that under control. It's only gotten worse. So you, I got, I'm going to put you on Crestor. He's like, but that's not the only problem here. He's like, another problem here is you have high estradiol, which is a precursor to estrogen. And I'm like, what does that even mean? He's like, well, basically you've got too much estrogen in your body. I was like, how do I, wait, what? Like, dude, like I'm, I'm pushing heavy weight in the gym. My sex drive is great. Like my body fat's pretty low. Like how in the world? And he's like, no, it really doesn't, you know, over time, what you basically just said, like that will probably dissipate with higher estrogen levels. You'll probably gain. And I'm like, well, how do I get that down? He's like medication. I'm going to send you to an endocrinologist. He goes, but there's more. And I'm like, okay, great. So now I'm a high cholesterol. I'm going to be a woman here soon. And what, what else? He's like, well, he's like, there's actually creatinine in your kidneys or in your urine. So now I'm concerned about kidney function. And I'm like, holy freaking shit, man. 
So I walked out of there and I was like, okay, well, I'm going to go make an appointment with it. I literally called the endocrinologist. I'm like, I'm gonna have to go make an appointment. And then I came home and I watched the show on Netflix called the game changers. And to be honest, I had no clue. It was plant-based athletes. I was just like, Oh, it's a bodybuilding thing or it's an athlete thing. I'm just going to, and then I was like, wait a second, this is a plant-based thing. And then it just so happened that you and I were connected through a mutual friend and I'd kind of followed you on Instagram and I watched that documentary and, I, and I'm not here to say that, you know, there's hype around that, right? People have challenged yeah. it, but at the same time, like, I was like, huh, I was like, this is kind of fascinating. So then I reached out to you and told you what was going on and we agreed. I was like, okay, well maybe before I jump into the medication world, maybe I'll try this for 30 days. And I was like insanely reluctant to it. I was like, I'll try this for my health. I don't know if, it, and I, to be honest, like when we first started working together, I was kind of hoping it would fail so I could go back to eating my meat. <laughs> um, and then we worked together for 30 days. I was, it took me a minute to get a hang of it, but, but that's why I say that you're an amazing coach. Cause you really helped me. You helped add things, not take things away. Mm. And then I decided to work with you for another 60 days. And then it was that 90 day mark that I was freaking blown away because I went back, I got blood work done. I hadn't done any of the medication. I didn't see the endocrinologist. My doctor put, he's like, Hey man, he's like, wow. He's like, Crestor's working. You know, estrogen <laughs> is back on point. He's like, your testosterone actually went up. He goes, and I, there's no creatinine in your, in your kidneys. So he's like, and then he, he, he's looking through the charts. He goes, I don't ever see though, that you actually met with the endocrinologist. Did you meet with one? And I was like, Nope. And he goes, you're taking the crest door, right? And I'm like, Nope. He goes, what are you doing? And I told him, he's like, man. And his response surprised me. He goes, if I could get more people to just simply eat a healthier diet, he's like, I, I do believe yeah, he's like, I'm not plant-based, yeah. but I do believe in the benefits of it. He goes, if I could get people to do what you did, people would avoid probably 90% of their health issues. So that's my story with you. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, dude, I'll be the first to tell you that most people's medication use is something that could be avoided or at least minimized to some extent. And you're a perfect example of that. You know, that if your power is in your hands with your nutrition and your lifestyle and it's scary, man. When you go get blood work done and things are not good, especially once you start getting into your thirties, forties, fifties, you're a lot more cognizant of your own mortality, especially when you have children and you don't, and it's scary to see numbers change. And all of a sudden you're like, wow, is, how is this negatively, how is this going to negatively impact my longevity? Um, you know, am I going to be around to see my kids graduate and, and grow up? That's my first thought for a lot of people. So for you to Re reverse all those things that normally would have been medicated um, is absolutely amazing. And, and I'm proud of you for doing that. Well, thank you, man. Again, I, it, it wouldn't have happened with, without your help. Uh, you know, here I am two years later, still plant-based. Um, and the, the cool thing about that is, is I, I didn't know how far down the rabbit hole, you know, you could really go with this as far as like being really creative with your foods and the, and the yeah. health benefits. And even like, <laughs> <laughs> even like I, I, there was a lot of things that it, I'm like, okay, well, if I'm vegan, then I can, I can eat, you know, morning star sausage patties and, and beyond <laughs> meat burgers all the time. And like, that's healthy. Right. And then I really realized learning from you, it's like, yeah, that stuff is okay every now and again, but it is not the cornerstone of a healthy plant-based diet. So yeah. I, I want to get into, um, just really some of the things that, uh, you know, people can maybe quite simply just start Mm. adding into their diet. And then I definitely want to segue into this whole thing of, you know, testosterone lowering, you know, mm. soy and all this other stuff, because I'm a perfect example. My, my testosterone was right around, I think 675 when I first started working with you. And that was mm -hmm. all. And then now I just got it taken not too terribly long ago. It's 865. Yeah. And dude, I'm, I'm 46 years old and yeah. it's 865. And I have not lost any muscle, my body fat's low I, and it's good. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I would say the first thing, and you touched on it before when you were saying to focus on addition rather than just subtraction. You know, a lot of guys, when they're doing a challenge, when they're looking at cleaning their life up, 
they're thinking about, oh man, I've got to remove the alcohol. I've got to remove the steak. I've got to remove this. I've got to remove that. And it's just nothing but removal. And it creates such a negative connotation with change because you're thinking about everything that you're losing. You're thinking about everything that you've got to let go of. And all these voids are being created in your life that then all of a sudden you've got to try and fill with something real quick. Otherwise, it's like the void fills back up again. It's almost like you, you know, you, you dig a hole in wet sand. And if you don't do something with that hole quickly, the wet sand just kind of caves back in on itself. And very often I find that just eliminating things is like that. If you don't intentionally fill that void or that gap with something productive, you'll relapse. And so from the perspective of what we did with you and what I suggest to a lot of people is to focus on addition. It's kind of this crowd out method that I, I I talk about religiously. And, you know, I'll be the first to tell you, man, as a former butcher, and even once I left the butchery before I was vegan, I used to be a ferocious meat eater. I would out eat meat on most guys. I'm telling you that, like my wife will attest to that. There'd be a day where on an average day, man, I'd be consuming six whole eggs, two chicken breasts, uh, two, two to four fillets of tilapia, probably a steak. And that's just, that's not including protein shakes and everything else. Yeah. I went hard, man. Like I went hard in the paint and uh, my cholesterol was like super high. Everything for me was really jacked up like you, but dude, it was jacked up for me when I was in my late twenties. And so I'm like, wow, if it's jacked up for me in my late twenties, what am I going to look like in my late thirties or forties? God save me. Right? So the first thing is to focus on addition or crowd out method. And so what I mean is try different things, you know, maybe you, and this is where the bridging tools come into play. So you mentioned like the morning star or beyond burgers or things like that. There's a ladder of progression here, guys, where food is not good or bad. It's context related. And what I mean by this is some people say, oh, well, you know, that food, that's not healthy, is it? Well, I'm going, well, if you've been eating nothing but like a bucket of grease and bacon, that's a step in the right direction, right? So there's this ladder of progression of like, can you make incremental steps in the right direction? So the first thing that I did was I crowded out the old foods with new things. So what I would do is I would look at, okay, can I get some different like veggie burgers or quinoa burgers? Can I add in some lentil pasta? You know, the lentil pasta or the edamame pasta was like high in protein. And so I would add those things in. I would look at things that were high in protein, whether it be tempeh, tofu, and we can talk about tofu and soy as well. And we'll, we'll, we'll dive into that. Um, hempeh. And I would look at those things and I would say, okay, I'm just going to add them into my diet. Even if I'm still consuming some of the animal products, I'm going to add them in. And so what I would do is I would add these things in and I would start to add more and more of them in. And I would slowly decrease down my portions of some of my animal products. And eventually what I found, man, was the only thing through this crowd out method, the only thing that I had to change at the very end was I was consuming a couple of eggs from the farmer's market after my workout. And all I did was for me personally, I swapped it over and did a tofu scramble. And I was like, is that it? Like, am I done? Like, it didn't seem painful. Like, I don't feel like I'm like missing anything. It was over like a one month period. And I was like, and I feel really good. I wasn't, I wasn't taking naps in the middle of the day. Like I used to, I wasn't getting all this reflux. Like I used to, I just felt dramatically different. And I was like, is that it? Like, I thought it was going to be more painful than this, kind of like pulling teeth or something, you know? And so the crowd out method and this integration method of adding things in, add so many healthy plant-based foods in that the portions of the other things just diminish as a natural byproduct. So that's the, that's the, that's the first step. And then obviously, like I mentioned to you, the bridging tools. So if you've been eating a really poor diet, then you adding in, you know, Beyond Burgers or some type of plant-based meat alternative could be a good bridging tool to get you in the right direction. It doesn't mean you want to stay on that step, but it means it could get you over to over the hump, over the psychological hump, basically. So there's psychological aspects to this, as well as understanding someone's context. Now, if someone's coming from a really clean non-vegan diet where they've just been consuming like clean whole foods, you can almost skip some of those steps and get them straight to a more advanced diet if they have the, the psychology to kind of like go all in and embrace that. 
And it just depends on the person, man. Everyone's different. Like the approach that I use with you is different than an approach that I would use with someone else purely based on where the person's at and where are their bottlenecks and what are they struggling with? So that's, that, that would be the first thing. And then the other thing that I think is really important and it's, it's a very simple thing is eat the rainbow. I mean, like literally just think to yourself, when you're looking at your main meals, where's your red vegetable, like your red bell pepper, or maybe you got some, um, you know, red, like red cabbage, sauerkraut or tomatoes, which is where's awesome, your red. By the way. Yeah. Yeah. Dude. Like yeah. where's your red. And I mean, you do this with your meals as well. So where's your red, where's your green, maybe your greens, like kale, spinach, broccoli, asparagus, whatever. Where's your orange carrots or, or orange peppers. Where's your yellow. That could be like yellow squash, yellow peppers, whatever. And if you focus on colors, each color is representative of a different micronutrient value or spectrum. One of the things that people need to realize, man, is that we don't just eat for macronutrients. Like we don't just eat for protein, carbohydrates, and fats. We eat for the micronutrients in terms of selenium, folate, magnesium, iron, omega-3s, omega-3 to 6 to 9 ratio. So when you focus on colors, you're more likely to get, to get a wide range or a wide spectrum of micronutrients. Why this is important is because if you're getting a lot of cravings and you're constantly fighting yourself with your diet and you're like, man, my cravings are just like through the roof. One part of that equation is because you're missing micronutrients. There'll be things in your diet that you're missing. Your body is trying to send you a signal saying, hey, Larry, we're, we're low in boron right now, or we're low in selenium. We need these substrates to create hormones. We need these substrates to create metabolic processes. And it will send you this signal. And most people just think, oh, like me, me craving. And they just go grab like a burger, right? Like there's no, there's no, we don't understand the language anymore. Like we've lost touch of what that language is trying to communicate to us. And I call it biofeedback. And so the second part is eating the rainbow. And if you, if you just focus on a wide range of colors, that's why if you get like a California stir fry mix, it's usually going to have three or four colors straight in there. You could just throw that in your meal and you're already, ha- you're already doing much better than the average person. Mm. So it's, it can be simple things like that. Yeah. Because the, the nature of just men in general, right. Is to be very, very extreme. It's like, I'm either going to go all in and just eradicate everything that I'm doing, rip the bandaid right off and just go. And then that lasts usually a pretty short amount of time, but I like this and that's what you do with me. And that's what I really liked the most as well is like, I didn't feel like I was necessarily, I never really felt depleted. I felt like I was like, okay, well, if this is my goal to add these colors and the colors are cool, you know? Um, and if you follow, you know, any plant-based athlete on, on Instagram and stuff like that, um, one of the, one of the guys I follow too is I think it's vegan bodybuilding because he's always posting, um, Mm -hmm. his food when I'm like, wow, it's pretty creative. That looks really, really good. And, um, but you know, I, I want to get into this topic too, because I, listen, When we first started working together, I was like, oh my God, like I hear all this stuff around how if I'm eating plant-based, my libido is going to drop, my testosterone is going to drop, my estrogen is going to go up. And the the thing about it is, is that the data, man, it's, it's very, very confusing for people. You know, they hear that and they're like, well, I ain't touching that. Right. But one thing that... (laughs) I know we were joking in the very first show about like uh, quality erections and we were like, you know, I was, I was making a note because I was like, I, I really do think like, you know, I, I have lower cholesterol now. Like my cholesterol is below, it's in the one, my total cholesterol is in the one nineties now, which that was the, my, that was my bad cholesterol. Was, yeah. Yeah. So it's dropped, you know, a hundred points and my bad cholesterol is below um, 100 now, which is awesome. But uh, you know, one of the things that I was concerned about is my sex drive. Like, listen, I'm a guy, right? And I was concerned about my testosterone. I'm in my forties. Like, I don't want to, I don't want to jeopardize my testosterone. Right. And what I've noticed is over the past two years, my testosterone has gone up when you're supposed to be quote unquote losing it. And I thought my sex drive would, if my wife was in here, she would confirm this. She was like, you have a higher sex drive now 
than you did when we were in college. And it's true. And <laughs> I'll be honest. I mean, like I've done research on, you know, if you have high cholesterol, you know, a good, and we'll just say it for what it is, a good quality er- erection has to do with blood flow. Yeah. And I swear to God, man, I mean, there's got to be a correlation because, you know, like I have, <laughs> I'm just being real. I have better erections now in my forties than I did in my thirties. And I think probably a lot of it has to do with my cholesterol is lower. My testosterone is higher. And, you know, I don't have anything blocking the lanes, so to speak, yeah. as like, I, like I probably used to. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, think of, I kind of, you know, attribute it to like a canary in the coal mine where um, usually what they'll say is if you're having trouble with erections and things of that nature, that's usually the canary in the coal mine of that. That's something else is potentially more serious is going to happen because you think about it, you've got capillaries, blood vessels, and all those extremities. And if your cholesterol is high and you're getting atherosclerosis and, and plaque buildup through your cardiovascular system, the first place that it's going to impact the most is those extremities and those cap- capillaries. And then it's going to work its way into your, you know, your main arteries and then, you know, into your heart. And so that is the canary in the coal mine, man. And, um, you know, I'll, I'll, I'll caveat this first by saying, you know, in our pre podcast discussion, you know, I got my blood work done so we can both talk, touch on our blood work, yours. And then obviously just share some of my markers. I got in a very extensive one done. Um, everything was good. My, um, so my, my, my free testosterone, the range, it was in nanograms per deciliter. Um, so it's a slightly different metric to the one that you got, but the range is quite large. So the range is five nanograms per deciliter to 21. Mine's 22.03. So mine is above the normal range. And this is on no hormone replacement therapy or anything of that nature. My luteinizing hormone and my follicle stimulating hormone are the two primary precursors to testosterone production. That will usually be suppressed on guys that are uh, using testosterone replacement therapy. Mine was well within the normal range for those two things, which is indicative that that transfers over to having better testosterone ratios. And then to, to your point about estradiol, again, one of the common things, right? Like soy, estrogen, that type of thing. I love air fried tofu. Like, I mean, obviously I'll rotate my proteins. I use lentil pasta and tempeh and, and, and lentils and chickpeas and all these different things. But I am a big fan of like a well, a crispy air fried tofu. And I consume it in some capacity almost every day. And I'm eight plus years in now as, uh, as a vegan. And my estradiol, the range is eight to 35, 30, over 35 being high. Mine's 11.7. The bottom of the range is eight. So straight away, like there's a lot more to hormone profiles than just one single food choice too. So we can dive into that because I think this is the confusion for most people is that they think that one food is going to attribute to some of these biomarkers being good or bad. You've got to think of it like like a math equation and there's multiple parts to the equation. It's not just one thing. And so you got to look at your, your overall lifestyle, like your, your, your stress levels, like your sleep cycles. Like, are you getting like a regular sleep wake cycle? How much alcohol are you consuming? How much processed foods are you consuming? This, for me, there are some key things that I think can really improve your testosterone and hormone function in general. And one, the first thing is just like either eliminating or massively reducing your alcohol consumption making sure that you're getting a a regular sleep wake cycle from the perspective of try to go to bed the same time, try to wake up the same time, seven days a week. I've noticed that in guys that have a very uh, mismatched cycle where some nights it's very late and, and then other times it's very, you know, they're sleeping in and then they're getting up really early and then they're staying up really late. Not only does it affect like a lot of their metrics, like on their aura ring or their Fitbit, it affects their heart rate variability and their resting heart rate. I think that it plays a role in like in suppression or amplification of certain hormones, because you think about this, like your, your sleep cycle is the, the governing biological clock in your body. It's the main clock system that all the other hormones basically get triggered off. And so early in the morning, for example, your cortisol will increase and that's what raises you up out of sleep. So it raises your resting heart rate 
and you wake up out of sleep through cortisol secretion in the morning. Equally, testosterone, growth hormone, certain things are released at certain times of the day. So if you can get a very regular sleep-wake cycle, you're much more likely to maximize all those other biological clocks with, within the master clock itself. So I wanted to mention that because that's a, one that people overlook that's non-dietary related. Now, in terms, of, in, in terms of diet, and we can talk about like your diet and some of your blood work in a second as well, um, but I, I think there's something to be said about making sure that some of the key minerals in your diet are factored in. So some of the things that I meticulously make sure, and, and what I do, like, and what I did with you when I was crafting out some of your nutritional protocols is I look at whether it's in my fitness pal or chronometer, I look at the daily recommended intakes of each thing and I look at what you're low in. So based on your eating patterns, you might be undershooting certain things. Now, I, I think that you can supplement things with multivitamins and things like that, but that should be like a secondary line of defense after you try and get everything from whole foods first as much as humanly possible. And so what I did with you is I, I looked at each aspect of things and I looked at your blood work and then I reverse engineer based on what I know about how food impacts hormone changes in the body, what foods are going to drive the, the, the responses we want to see and what foods are going to drive optimal nutrient, you know, micronutrients that we want to see. And so what you want to be doing is making sure that the key things are going to be like your vitamin D, your vitamin D status. So like you want to make sure that your vitamin D status is good because that one is a precursor to testosterone function. It also helps with immune function. So one of the main things in terms of bolstering your immune response to just being resilient against any flu, virus, bacterial infection, anything is your vitamin D status. Then other things like your zinc, boron, magnesium, and selenium. So there's going to be obviously other ones, but those ones are the main ones that I would look at and then add foods in that are high in those things and put them into your routine. So there's a logic behind it, man. But I want people to realize that it's not just one food that's going to drive these changes or this outcome. It's like a wave of progressions. It's a wave of additions. And then as you crowd the other things out, you get the benefits of maybe some of those detrimental things being crowded out of your diet as well. Mm. I yeah, love that, man. And, you know, talk, talk to me about the science behind the, the people are saying, you know, Hey, if you, if you eat soy, it's going to radically reduce your testosterone. And yeah. I remember and and to be real honest, I mean, this probably sounds terrible, even though I've been plant-based for so long, I actually don't know all the science behind it. I, I just, and I, and they debunked that in, um, in, in the, uh, in the game changers a little bit about how it not only doesn't do that, but it actually has certain blocking mechanisms of, of estrogen in a way, but yeah. I don't, I can't remember how it was articulated, but then people will Google, right? Like does soy reduce testosterone or in increase estrogen? And people are always like, Hey, I, I looked it up and it does. But so yeah. like, I think that's where like the confusion is. Why, why is yeah. that? I, I think this? part of, I think part of it is because Obviously, first of all, there's a lot of just misinformation and anecdotal experiences that get circulated through the fitness space as, as religion, as fact, right? So the first thing is people are using anecdotes and their personal experiences and then drumming it up to some type of fact. And the second thing is that a lot of the studies that you see are done in things like mice and rats, and they're, they're pumping them and they're giving like the mega doses of things in a controlled environment where they're not consuming anything else. And so they're running these experiments that you wouldn't see replicated in a real world environment with a human that is not stuck in a lab in a cage that's being drip fed soy milk. <laughs> so because of that, it, there's so many cofactors that you can't control for with, with people unless you like held them captive. Like it, it's very hard to get these controlled experiments. Because again, you have all these other factors like stress, sleep, like gut health and the absorption of, of foods, the quality of your foods, um, you know, the meal preparation of them. Was there, you know, was there certain inflammatory oils on them? And so there's so many other things that I think are hard to account for that 
I just literally use my own experience and then examples like of, of real world people, you know, coming back to anecdotes. Yeah. For the most part, that's what I just share with my own journey. I'm like, look, this is what I'm doing. This is, this is what I've seen. Um, but that one of the things that I, I will say that I, I'm always wondered about and I'm wary about is how much of the information out there is fun, has industry funded incentives. Now, there's a book called Metanomics. So not economics, but Metanomics, where he, he does a very good job of citing and connecting a lot of the more well-known studies back to egg board or the dairy or the dairy council or these different industries that have some type of vested interest in making look plant-based alternatives look terrible. And one of the other things that you'll often see in some of the research when they're trying to compare vegans or vegetarians to omnivorous diets is that they're not comparing whole food plant-based people that are eating a really well-rounded healthy diet. They're comparing junk food vegans, junk food vegans to someone who's eating a whole food omnivorous diet. So you can be eating ice cream and vegan donuts and all kinds of crap on, on a vegan diet. And so they're just comparing ethical vegans to these groups. And so these people, first of all, a lot of them may not care about their health. And the second thing is you, it's not comparing apples and apples. You're not comparing the whole food plant-based diet with a whole food omnivorous diet. And so straight away, your control groups are skewed. So I definitely think that there's a lot of just misinformation and rat studies and things of that nature that, that circulate. A lot of the, the, the research that I have seen on soy consumption and things of that nature actually supports it being cardiovascular protective, being good for bone health, um, actually being good for uh, freeing up testosterone, bound up testosterone. And so part of the equation with testosterone isn't just your total testosterone. It's your, your free testosterone as well. Now, uh, there's, a, there's a hormone called sex hormone binding globulin, SHBG, and that binds up testosterone. And one of the things that I've seen in the research is that a well-planned plant-based diet can actually bring that number down if it's elevated. And what that does is that frees up more of that bound testosterone to be used in your body uh, for, for positive reasons. So, and again, there's, there's positive reasons for all of these things. Um, no, no hormone is good or bad. Um, but I definitely think, you know, the listeners need to understand that when you're looking at testosterone, it's not the only thing. Like people don't realize that if your estrogen is too low, that will equally affect your libido negatively. If your estrogen is too low, that can give you depression. And so guys that are like really obsessed with getting the estrogen low, not many people will because most people have excess body fat. Most people are consuming too much alcohol. There's a lot of uh, phytoestrogen mim mimicking compounds in our environments and endocrine disruptors in a lot of the body washes and things we're consuming. But for the guys that want to get the estrogen too low, low estrogen has been associated with depression, low libido, as well as obviously testosterone. So it's not just that. There are other factors to the equation. And then you know, the other part of you mentioned with, with cholesterol, another part that I think kind of coincides with cholesterol that's really important is your A1C levels. So like your blood glucose levels, because usually what you'll find is that guys that have high A1, so your A1C is the average blood glucose level over a three month period. Guys that typically will run high A1C, that means you're pre-diabetic or insulin resistant. When you're in that insulin resistant zone, that's another canary in the coal mine. That's, that's being borderline diabetes. And as you move into that, your body fat, you, it becomes harder to lose body fat. And as your body fat levels go up because you're more insulin resistant, you aromatize more estrogen as a byproduct of having higher levels of body fat. So it's kind of like this vicious cycle. As you gain body fat, you not only make it more difficult for yourself to lose it, but you aromatize more estrogen because of the body fat. And so your estrogen levels increase too much, which then can bring down your testosterone function. So there's a lot of seesaws with this stuff, but I don't want guys to get caught up in just thinking that one food 
as a determining factor. And one thing that I've often thought about, and I've seen other specialists talk about this. There was a guy that you had on Dr. Zach Bush, for example. I mean, it's such a, such a knowledgeable, knowledgeable human being. And um, he, he did a discussion where he'd been looking at the, the RNA and, and different cells and, and how it functions with food. And, in turn, and one of the things that he said that really I, I'll never forget, and he said, think about this, people are so consu- concerned about plant proteins, but when we're consuming animal products, although all those animals are female, they're all female, like you, cows, chickens, not, they're not roosters. We're not eating bulls. We're eating cows, chickens, female pigs, and you, you're consuming the, the mammalian secretion in the form of milk, which is lactate. And so all of these things have mammalian estrogen circulating through the bloodstream, circulating within these systems and cells. And so straight, that really struck, uh, like, I, I won't forget that because I was like, wow. Like, and so what he, what he was indicating was that we shouldn't be as worried about consuming plants when phytoestrogens don't even dock to our receptors like mammalian estrogen does because we are a mammal. So because we are a mammal, we have the ability for mammalian estrogen to dock much more strongly. And so you think about all the animal products people consume, it's all from female animals. So that really left a, a resonation with me in terms of like, wow, that, that was something that I'll never forget. So yeah, I mean, it's just one of those things where it, it's a multitude of different factors and we can maybe even dissect the factors if you want. Yeah, let's let's definitely give the audience some of that. But real quick before we do that, I, I'll never forget reaching out to you because, like I said, when I when I first started going plant based, there was a part of me that was like, I kind I kind of hope this fails, or I kind of mm. hope that I can poke some holes in it so I can just go back to the way I was eating before because that was like my comfort zone, right? And um, <clears throat> when I asked you, I was like, wait, just well, how how is this possible? Like, how does my estrogen, my estradiol, go back within normal range because it did? within 90 days. And that's the way it stayed. And then my testosterone went up and I was like, Fraser, I was like, what, why is that? And then when you said that to me, cause you said that to me a long time ago, which was, well, think about it. You're eating estrogenic laced animal mm-hmm. tissue. Like you don't eat bull, you eat cow, you don't eat rooster, you eat chicken. And I was like, Oh my God. Like literally it was in that moment, I felt like I was Neo and you were Morpheus and you gave me the red <laughs> pill and I was like, oh my God, I didn't even think of it that way. So I thought that was pretty brilliant, but yeah, let's talk about some of the factors. Yeah. So like I mentioned, obviously your, your sleep cycles are really important. Um, one of the things that I think also, like I mentioned, coming back to simplicity is that rainbow concept. Cause like I told you, you know, you're eating not just for protein, not just for fa- essential fatty acids and carbohydrates and things like that, but you're eating for minerals and vitamins. And the reason why these things are important is because they have different functions in your body. And so, like I mentioned, foods high in boron, foods high in magnesium, foods high in selenium. Like I consume Brazil nuts every day because of the selenium content. And so because of these foods, these things are, are the building blocks for some of these hormone profiles. So it's not just a protein. It's what is the package deal with this protein? You know, when I'm thinking about foods, I'm not just thinking about the protein or the fats. I'm thinking, what are the micronutrient values within this as well? Because if you can get a range of foods that hit all these daily recommended intakes of a variety of things, Think of a food kind of like software and your body is the, the hardware. So your body's the computer, food is the software. You can either have software that is a good operating system update for your computer and it will iron out any bugs. If there's any glitches happening, it kind of speeds things up, you know, it frees up some space. Things tend to work more smoothly with an operating system update. Alternatively, malware, if you get some malware, everything glitches, things start to crash, uh, stall, slow down. Food is like that in our body. And so what we put in our body is like software and it's essentially telling our hardware how to operate. We're building cells, we're building muscles, we're building hormone profiles off this software. And so if you're consuming a lot of prepackaged 
foods, a lot of processed stuff, or you're just eating a very myopic diet, you know, a typical bodybuilding diet of just like tilapia and broccoli, chicken and asparagus. And like you're, you're interchanging with sweet potato and rice. And that's like your whole life. That's nothing, nothing outside of that. It's a, it's such a narrow spectrum within the, within the overarching spectrum of, of nutrients that you could be getting that that's why guys get problems with cravings like mood. It's that's, I would say one of the fundamental reasons why people, when they're trying to diet, get dips of an energy digestive problems. Maybe they lose their libido. They have all kinds of just, you know, they're just getting brain fog. Part of it is they're in a, they're operating within a very narrow spectrum of their micronutrient intake and their body's missing all kinds of things. And the body is like, we need to cut costs. We need to trim everything down to just keep this person alive. And so it will decrease production of all kinds of things. You see this with with women, for example, who are trying to do fitness competitions. And if they diet too aggressively, they lose their monthly cycle. They lose their menstrual cycle. That's a huge red flag that something hormonally is going wrong. I've seen this with guys who have done really aggressive diet challenges and they crash their testosterone and everything goes down. It's not that their system is broken. It's that the methods they used to get there were crashing their system. They were, they were, they were using malware to cra- and it was crashing the system. So the whole thing is to understand that too. And beyond just that rainbow concept, one of the other things that I love to add into the routine, and I've seen that you do it as well, is living foods. And what I mean by living foods is sprouts. So broccoli sprouts is a, is a staple for me every day. And then microgreens. The reason why I like to do microgreens is because gram for gram, they have more micronutrients than their fully grown counterparts. So if you're trying to get as much vitamins and minerals into your system to maximize how you feel, how you think, everything, but you don't want to be eating a wheelbarrow full of food, then you want to get things in very nutrient-dense packages. So microgreens, kale microgreens, Broccoli microgreens, all of those things are much more nutrient dense. So I love to think about things in terms of density. And then obviously broccoli sprouts is another addition being so high in a compound called sulforaphane, which is highly, highly anti-cancerous. So I kind of tell guys to add it in there, literally like your insur- like an insurance policy. Cancer is so prevalent in our world today for, for a number of reasons that I consume broccoli sprouts and have consumed them every day for years because of the highly anti-cancerous effect that they have. And so I want the audience to realize that it's not just about muscle and protein. It's about when you get there, are you the healthiest version of yourself? Because you can be a bodybuilder shooting up all the steroids in the world and eating chicken and broccoli, and you could feel absolutely terrible, absolutely terrible. Like your blood work would be absolutely horrendous. You're going to need a ton of caffeine to function. You'll probably need sleep aids to help yourself get into sleep. It's just horrendous. And so I definitely am always, and you know this, having done the stuff, being in the trenches, that it's always coming from a health first process, that your health, your blood work, if you get those things right first, the transformation is a byproduct of that. It's a byproduct of that. But you can get a physical transformation without addressing the internal stuff. And usually it's very, very hard to sustain long term because you'll burn out, you, you, your hormones will crash because you're not addressing the internal stuff. So I definitely think that the sleep's one part of it, that the rainbow concept microgreens and living foods sprouts. The other part of it, I think, is maximizing your gut health. So I think one of the gut thing that most guys will probably struggle with is absorption. Remember, guys, it's not just about what you eat. It's about what you absorb. If you're eating 250 grams of protein a day and you've got all these amino acids coming into your system, but your gut health is completely trashed from alcohol, antibiotics, and acids, 
stress, processed foods, all of these things, then your ability to absorb those nutrients is diminished. I've had people come to me, Larry, that would consume blueberries and literally poop the whole blueberries out the other end. Oh my God. The digestive system was so shot. Jeez. And their stomach acid content was so diluted and weak that they weren't even breaking down blueberry walls to even get the antioxidants from the blueberries. And so you've the gut health aspect of things is, is huge. And that's one of the beautiful things about a plant-based diet is that when you do it the right way and you add things in slowly and you slowly incrementally increase your fiber intake, and we can talk about that as well, it's usually associated with positive gut health outcomes, just as a byproduct of you doing a plant-based diet. So it's not like there's, you know, there are things you can do, um, but just by doing a whole food plant-based diet and sticking with it and eliminating or cleaning everything else up, your gut health will improve as a byproduct of that alone. Yeah. That's one of the things that I learned from you first was, Hey man, it's not necessarily about what you take in. It's what your body is going to absorb. Right. Yeah. And you know, it makes total sense. You know, even now, like I, I learned a few new things, even on this podcast, talking to you that I haven't either. I, I, I pro, you probably told them to me a long time ago, but I just didn't probably recall them, which is, you know, everybody and their brother, when it comes to health is focused on macros. Yep. And this was a really in-depth reminder of why micronutrients are so important because if you're only focused on macros and you're living on chicken, broccoli, and rice, or if you think, and if you're not living on those things, but you view that as like, well, that's what I need to be healthy. That's how I have to be healthy is sticking to like those 10 foods. You know, you we're really missing the mark because that's not sustainable. Like our, our bodies obviously need the micronutrients in order to have the functions necessary for hormone precursors and yeah, adequate recovery and, and stress and gut health, all, all these things that are so, so important because, you know, you could be eating all the chicken, rice and broccoli in the world, but you know, our, there's, there's going to be a price to pay for that as well. And that's going to be maybe lower absorption. It's going to be our hormones aren't firing right because you're right. The body is wired to survive. And if it has to go shut things down, that shouldn't be shut down because you're not doing the right things. You're not going to get the results that you want anyway. So, yeah. And, and you know, some interesting research came out where they were looking at the, the gut microbiomes of, I believe this tribe in Africa, and they were predominantly plant-based and they were, and they were looking at the diversity of their flora in terms of their bacteria and their gut. And it was just this fascinating observation of how rich their microbiomes were compared to Western people. And they observed and they studied and they followed this tribe and they consume over 40 unique plants every week, sometimes up to a hundred, but 40 unique plants was found to be the, the optimal minimum baseline for optimizing your gut microbiome. And so what I mean by 40 unique minimum plants is kale's one, carrots are another, Lentils is one. It's not, it sounds like a lot, but when you're eating a whole food plant based diet, you can hit that number really quick. I mean, just with your bowls and your meals, you're getting 10 plus just from that. And that's just one meal. And so you want to think about adding in diversity because it's not just about calories and it's not just about macros. And so that's always been my focus. And coming back to the point that I mentioned at the start of the podcast about where I came from you know, like struggling with tons of mental health issues. I had like no attention span. My anxiety was through the roof. Dude, I was self-medicating like crazy. I was taking, uh, you know, Ritalin to get myself up. And then I was taking tons of uh, anti-anxiety drugs to kind of crash myself down. And everything was just this roller coaster. And so for me, especially, especially when I became a father, I realized how important my energy level, energy to me is like currency. Like, as you guys know, any father who's listening to this, I'm, I'm assuming most people listening to this are fathers or to be fathers, that it, energy, your energy levels are like currency, that if you don't have good energy, your mood's bad, you have no patience with your family, your temperament sucks, your productivity with your job is not good, your ROIs in your life, it's, it's, it's horrible. And that was me. 
And so my fascination with these things is because I was a sufferer of it. That's why I'm so fanatical about it. I, before I went plant-based, I used to have to take sometimes two naps per day, man, two naps, not just one, but two, like, and this was, this was before our daughter was even born. Like I, I wasn't even a parent. And so I knew that when she was born, if I did not truly, truly optimize the internal stuff, that everything would be difficult, everything. And so that's why I have this ferocious obsession with the chemistry in our body and even understanding what's happening in our brain. And so like another thing that I think just to to segue back into the gut health stuff is that a huge part of your serotonin production and housing starts in your digestive system. Serotonin is one of of the, the neurotransmitters that helps you feel good. And usually what you'll find is that guys who have mood issues or just like low energy, brain fog, cognitively, something's not quite there. They'll usually have gut issues as well. Most of the time, sometimes they won't notice the gut issues because they've had them for so long. But I've noticed time and time again, when I've improved people's digestion, it improves everything, their mood, their temperament. Obviously, it's, it's obvious, right? Like if you're really bloated and you're feeling terrible, you're not going to be energetic and feeling like hot and sexy or any of that stuff. You know, like you'll feel miserable. And so this stuff to me, man, like coming back to the, the, the most important thing is that when you do these things well and you, and you train properly, the physical results are a byproduct. You don't have to sacrifice one for the other. I'm not saying that you have to sit here and obsess with macronutrients and be this nerd that calculates everything and and you never have any gains and you'll never look like you'll never look like a Spartan. You can actually look that way and you can do this. And I would actually argue that that's the better way to do it because that's how you create the long term sustainable process. It's not like this yo the seasonal yo yo approach. So I think that the gut health is another important one. Um, And the other thing that I think is also really valuable, and I just like to do this to get a variety again of nutrients, is to just rotate your food choices. And so I pick like three or four proteins, you know, like tempeh, tofu, lentil pasta, lentils, chickpeas. That's like my, my, my top five. And I'll rotate through those. So on a, on a daily and weekly basis, I'll go through this sort of like mental rotation. And it's the same thing with my carbohydrates. So whether it's sweet potato or gold potato or quinoa or rice or some type of other rice and grain blend, I'll rotate through those things. Again, part of it is to keep your sanity. And coming back to the point, like if you have guys listening to this and they're like, yeah, this sounds good. It makes sense. But like, I just won't enjoy the food. Like it just doesn't, it won't be appealing to me. You've got to find condiments and cooking methods to make the food taste good. I say to people all the time, like how often would you just eat a a plain boiled chicken breast (laughs) that in and of itself, dude, like that's not appetizing to most people. And so if you're just cooking tofu and you're not doing anything to it, it's the same as just consuming a plain chicken breast. And so you need to make sure that you're flavoring your foods with different spices and herbs and sauces. A sauce that I love, if you're in the US, it's called, it's literally called bitchin sauce, literally. And, 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 and it's good. And so I'll add certain condiments to my meals, an air fryer. Like, I mean, if you haven't got an air fryer, guys, get an air fryer. One, it cuts down the cooking time dramatically. So your meals don't take as long. You're not adding extra calories to your meals in the form of all these extra oils. So you can, you can get into more of a caloric restriction easier. And you're getting, making this crispy texture with your meals. Like it's the texture and it's the taste, the flavor. Salt your meals a little bit. Then that way, that's one of the other things that I, I think is important to, to note is that if you've come from a place where you're, you're used to eating a lot of fats or salt, you need to make sure that you don't just like rip it all out and have nothing. And so what I do is I encourage guys to you know, add a little bit of salt to your meals. I even put a little bit of salt on a teaspoon and I'll consume that before my workouts. Oh my God. There's something to be said dude, about, about using minerals like salt. Yeah. People get Salt gets a bad rap. Sodium gets a bad rap. But what I will argue is that it's a bad rap given the context 
Most people, they consume so many processed foods that their sodium intakes through the roof. And then it causes all this water retention and blood pressure increases and things like that. If your diet's pretty clean and you're sweating a lot and you're training, you actually need those minerals to create muscle contraction. And so that, and, and also that helps give it that palate, that palate familiarity where you're getting some salt, it, it, it tastes some, of something familiar. So I definitely think there's something to be said with texture and flavor alongside everything else. Because if you don't address those things, then it will be boring. And then you need, so you want to account for those things. Yeah, man. And that's a, that's a really good comparison. Uh, I remember I used to train for bodybuilding shows back in the day. I haven't done a show in 10 years, but uh, I remember the days where it was like chicken breasts, like plain, yeah. like nothing. And I'm just like, if I eat one more still to this day, cause Jessica, my wife, she competed with me a couple of times and still to this day, she's like, I cannot stand the taste of a plain chicken breast. I still can't do it. It takes, it takes me back to that time where I was eating like three of them a day and I just can't do it. But man, this has been so good. Uh, I want to make sure, you know, that the men, you know, who, if they're like, man, like this has been on my mind, this has been on my heart. Um, I, I need a guide, you know, or I, or they at least just want to connect with you. I mean, you, you, you post some really great stuff, especially on Instagram. I love seeing your Instagram posts. They're really inspirational. They give me new ideas for my stuff. Um, plus if you want to see what Fraser looks like, and if you're doubting if a vegan diet actually has benefits to your physique, just go check, a, go check Fraser out, um, at veg up life, uh, on Instagram, but where else can guys find you find, find more information yeah. or just connect with you? Yeah. I mean, so just, just veg up life or, or veg up on Facebook or search, you know, Fraser Bailey, uh, F R A S E R B A Y L E Y on Facebook. Um, they can email me Fraser at veg up Um, but you know, I just want to just, just leave you guys with this, this notion, like I said, at the start of challenges, challenging yourself to do diff- hard things. You know, I'll be the first to tell you, man, that, you know, especially in the, in the modern world that I find myself in, um, I get along with a lot of, I have probably more friends who are not vegan than are vegan. And that wasn't always the case. There was a period in, in my journey early on where I was heavily involved within the vegan community and I didn't have as many non-vegan friends. I would say now m- a lot of my friends are you know, former military. Some of them are hunters. I don't judge people for where they are in their journey. And one of the things that I, I keep coming back to as I challenge myself, how can I do difficult things when other people don't want to do it? And for me, it's like stacking credibility with yourself. And I love, and I love that idea because then I know that I can transfer that credibility into all these other areas. And the take home point is that if you can improve your blood work and improve your health and get off medications or prevent yourself getting on medications like you, Larry, and improve your body and do all these things and be a better version of yourself for your, for your partner and your kids and your community and your brand, then like you, you should do that. Like you, you want to do that. I I can't emphasize that enough. Like I want to see people actualize their potential and not just play in the sandbox all the time. So that's it, man. I mean, that's, that, that's my perspective. And, and, and like, you know, to be a walking representation of this part of why I train the way I do part of why I do what I do is to just say, Hey, I have some facts. I have some science. I have some knowledge, but I'm living it. You know, you're yeah. living it. And then that way people can just say, okay, like the results are in front of me. The results don't lie. And that's regardless of all the confusing misinformation circling around in the world, your results speak. And that's it. So true, man. So true. Gentlemen. Uh, well, first of all, man, this was awesome. Thank you for coming back on. I can't believe it's been a, it's been a year. Um, and you know, thank you for also serving in the Alliance because you, you run our Wednesday morning, uh, Mm -hmm. optimizing health and fitness and nutrition. And I know probably almost every guy on that call team, uh, is not a vegan, right. But, but, but I hear rave reviews on, on your call team and the, and the knowledge that you share with those guys to optimize, you know, their health as much as possible. Uh, you know, Hey guys, if, if this, uh, yeah, you bet, man. You know, obviously if the, if this, you know, if this spoke to you, 
Um, or if you, I mean, if you know somebody who's maybe tinkering with the idea around being vegan or they can optimize their health, you know, share this show with them as well. Uh, you, you'll be able to find everything that we talked about today. Uh, if you just go to the dadedge.com forward slash Friday three, six, again, the dadedge.com forward slash Friday three, six, we'll have all of Fraser's links in there. Um, his website is Instagram, you know, all those things if, if you're curious. So Fraser, thank you so much for coming on, man. This was, this was so much fun. It was an absolute pleasure, man. And, and, yeah. I, and I enjoy being in the Alliance and I enjoy sharing that stuff with the guys in the group. And like you were saying, most of the guys in the group are not plant-based, but again, I meet them where they are. And, and I think that is what people need. People don't need judgment. People don't need perfection. They just need to be met where they are. Yeah. Exactly. I hear right you, on, man. man. Right on, brother. Hear you. All right, gentlemen, that's all we got. This is the end of January. So hopefully maybe this was the health boost that you needed just to get back or maybe get some new ideas, maybe reignite the spark of, hey, why did you set those those health goals a month ago anyway? Maybe this reignited that why for you. Either way, Fraser and I are meeting you guys where you're at. And now you know where to find where we're at. Again, the dadedge.com forward slash Friday three six. Gentlemen, go out, live legendary. Take care.